Welcome to a brand new series. In this series, we'll be talking with Jim Weniger. We'll be examining a whole series of images of what we think are Birkman currents. And we will examine the features and discuss how some of these structures are formed. First up, we're going to look at some of the classic hourglass nebulas, which really is what we would consider to be a Z-pinch in a Birkman current. Now, we spoke, I think the last time that, that we uh, did a call like this was when we were looking at the procession series and the follow-up. And one of the things I think we discussed when we looked at that was uh, we were we were looking at some images of, of Birkeland currents and you helped me to sort of see the structure in them. And I think from that we got the idea that it might be useful to, to look at several different images and, and talk people through how they see the the Birkeland current being active in that so it's been it's been a long time sort of arranging it but here we go I would say now we've got quite a lot of images lined up we'll see where we get to so the first is what the NASA term as the twin jet nebula it's lovely name PNM29 and they call it a striking example of a bipolar planetary nebula and they believe that bi uh, bipolar nebula are formed when the central object is not a single star but a binary system and studies have shown that the nebula size increases with time and measurements of this rate of increase suggest that the stellar outbursts that formed the lobes occurred just 1200 years ago. Now this obviously is one of the classic images whenever I talk about Birkeland currents and I talk about z-pinches this is the image that I, I kind of go to. And I, I mean, I find it a beautiful image. But talk me through what you see when you look at this image, Jim. Well, yeah, it, it looks like a Z-pinch, and it looks like at least um, a, a couple distinct shells of material. And you can even see, like, smaller scale filaments within it going around more as smoothly at especially in the in the the central portion there um so here this um to the uh let's see move your cursor to the left a little bit <laughs> do you have the image because maybe if we jump to your screen or are you not in front of your computer it's fine yeah, we can just okay right right there right this one here yeah yeah, that 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 central shell, you can see right um, and up and well. down. There's like smaller scale filaments inside of there, like small Birkeland currents inside that larger one, going going almost vertically at the bottom left there. These here. Yes. So those would be filaments inside the shell of the. Um, that inner shell of the large scale Birkeland current. Yeah. So if we if we see we see there's like an outer edge to what what would have been the I, I guess the outer shell, which goes along in this direction, which then gets pulled in by the pinch structure, right. and then we see a, a, a secondary shell inside of here. And I think even if you look here on the outer one, you can start to see there are. And again, whether it's artifacting is hard to tell, but the similar sort of to me, similar structure to these vertical lines is what I'm seeing running along here. Right. So, like in in Don Scott's, as he explains with uh, the Bessel function filament, there should be multiple. You know, there should be a, a radius where the the magnetic field is wrapped around, and we should have smaller scale filaments circling, and then you should jump out to another radius where there's an azimuthal field and you should have filament circling and I, I think you can see both of those both yeah. of those in there smaller scale filaments circling around the larger scale filament I think we can also see what's interesting for me as well as these areas here so where obviously these are much brighter but obviously lie internally to I guess the inner structure of of the the filament which is being compressed here 
And then you also have these, what look like flowing lines moving inwards and the, the color difference between some of these areas. Obviously, you know, these colors are being caused by the excitation of the of the electrons in the plasma, which is emitting these colors. Um, but obviously, we would not normally see this. You know, if we were look, if we imagine that this is our sun that sits in in the middle, then currently we don't see any of this structure around our star because it, we don't sit in an area that is this active, and and I guess the current density is significantly lower compared to this. Would that be right? R right. Yeah. And 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 that's that's kind of the 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 problem that got us stuck in the beginning is. When you look out at the night sky, you see the stars. You don't see the filaments first. And so all our scientific theory in modern times was built up starting at the wrong point, basically. We start as the, the stars as fundamental. And then when we start to see these, um, these jets, we imagine them starting from the star and, and working like that. But the... the the answer has come when you when you realize that the, the stars are just the, the net result of the filament and not really the starting point. That look at the filaments first and then then the stars. So in in the um stellar circuit concept, we would also expect to see double layers that sit if this is the current flowing in, we would expect to see double layers. Um, some distance away from the star. And I'm just wondering whether that's what these structures on either side here might be. I think, I, I can't remember, I need to check, but I think in, in when Don Scott looked at these images, he identified several areas where potentially, like here and here, I think, and there and there, potential double layers uh, in that uh, circuit structure for the star. Is that ringing right. the bells with you? Yeah, and see, the, see the, the problem is what, what, what we're still not seeing. Like I said, it, originally we just saw the stars, and then we zoom in and we see these, these hourglass-shaped nebula. But what we're still not seeing is that there is um, double layers in, in, in space, even outside of this. Like, basically, that pinch should occur at a double layer. So there should be like right through the center of that pinch, a double layer up and down that we're not even seeing. And the only reason I say that is because where, where we do see pinches happening, where we, we can identify double layers, you know, the, um, the local chimney pinching at the, the galactic plane, pinches at the solar surface, um, and, and so on. So that, Basically, you almost know going in that they're to expect a double layer right up and down through the center of that pinch, and that's what we're not we're not seeing on this scale yet. Because it's too because we can't identify it. You mean it's 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 invisible, right. right? But we would expect to see double layers further out as well in in our stellar circuit if this is coming out and around somewhat like this in. Depending on which model of the star we obviously look at, right, right. Okay, let's let's move on to the second image. So if I pull up the second image, through the magic of uh, this one, so this is very similar, I think, in terms of um, its structure. Not quite as clear an image in terms of the colors, but I think another interesting example, because again, we see the star at the center. And, and for me in this image, the, again, you, you can see the, 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 almost the layers within that Birkeland current. And also we see the fact that at some point the, the plasma goes from glow mode back into dark mode. Um, so in terms of, let me actually put them both together. That might be an interesting, oh, I didn't mean to convert it, but. So if we see that's the, the one we just looked at, and then 
You see, there are striking similarities. This looks a little bit fatter, but again, you're not really seeing the whole image. This is much wider. The, the, if we compare the crop, then the crop would be about there compared to that other image. But again, I think similar features, it's not as clear, but we are seeing that there is some sort of surface pattern on that plasma on the sort of the outer tube right here. Right, and the fact right. that you see uh, the sort of different lines indicating shells within that uh, current structure. And again, it's so easy to find these. It's not difficult to find images like these. Uh, I think the classic definition here is, uh, they call it spectacularly symmetrical wings of HEN2437, um, icy blue hue. Again, they call it a planetary nebula, uh, and it is one of 3,000 such objects known to reside within the Milky Way. So that's within the Milky Way itself. We know of 3,000 of these types of objects, and there's probably many, many more. But how would you say this, why is this different to a normal star? Um, as far as what, why we're seeing it the way we are? Yeah, why is it that not all, that, that we can't see this structure around all stars? So my opinion, I think that the reason that we see these is because these are more newly formed stars would be my guess so that this is the energetic activity so you you create the z pinch at the center which forms the new star it's high energy um obviously the the current density must be extremely high which is why at that point you're you're effectively trying to squeeze in all of that current into a, a much smaller space and that causes this part of the uh, of the Birkeley current to glow. Now the question is, how does that then evolve over time so that it ends up looking like the stars around it and not the star itself? And that must be to do with the, the, the energy level that's present within the filament. So is it that the current flowing Your, through this decreases? Or, or is it that just, the pinch relaxes? Just changing in general. See, if, if you assume that... Um, Ideally, uh, a perfect um, minimum energy configuration, dark mode filament, you won't be able to see at all. You won't be able to detect it at all. But anytime there are, you know, transients in it, you, you'll, you know, an excitation, you'll see it. When, when, when it goes from dark mode to either an increase or a decrease or just an external change will give you that from a, from where most stars should be then in like a more dark mode filament, basically. But would you would you agree that, that you would expect to see this at formation? Or do you see that formation of the star doesn't necessarily mean that you would light up the whole Birkeland current? Yeah, well, since, I mean, they see a lot of these after... For example, su supernova events. It's important to understand why the mainstream got the, the models that they do. Is they see, for example, red giant stars going um, supernova, and then they see these um, hourglass shapes after after the remnant. But all that really means is there was a, a change in the, the the current flow there, and that's what took took the star from being visible to not. But it's the same change that then shows up in the entire the entire filament, basically. Yeah, so you would have to have a rapid change, right? Not uh, not necessarily increase or decrease, though. E either way, should should take it out of that um, dark mode and put it into um, like glow mode, basically. Yes, yeah, so a significant change, step change up or down, should excite the plasma uh, around it. And it's interesting right. that you say about the about the 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 the, the red giants, um, because they're obviously one of the precursors. One of the things specifically about red giants is that they are already surrounded by an awful lot of gas and material. Which, again, if you look at the the shape that some of those well, we 
kind of more talking about supernova explosions, you know, there's a lot of mater material that ends up being ejected, and we'll see some images later on. And the question is, where does that material come from in the first place? So again, that's something I, I think in terms of the, the the way that some of these Birkeland currents are structured together, and we have these, you know, what we identify as gas clouds. I think the movement of the stars through some of that you know, may affect it or the fact that maybe the Birkeland currents are carrying some of it into other areas may also be a factor in that. Right. And that that's the, the I mean, even being taking the more skeptical approach, forgetting about the, the whole EU ideas, what hasn't been addressed in the mainstream is that there seems to be an awful lot of coincidence of the um, red dwarf star, Barnard star being the highest proper motion star that we can observe. Arcturus, um, the only red giant star right in our neighborhood that has the highest proper motion of any first magnitude star. And all these bright blue stars in Gould's Belt all traveling together or in the Pleiades stream. So they're, they're kind of glossing over it. There's no mention of a star's motion in terms of its its color. So we end up with this huge series of coincidences that Yeah. It, and and that's not addressed because in the mainstream model it's only a function of a star's age. And then they can get to like secondary why maybe old stars could be moving together because they formed in the same region of space and and so on. But that still doesn't give them that doesn't give them the right correlation to um to the st uh, stellar colors we see and the stellar motions, basically. Yeah. In part two, we will examine more complex images where rather than a side-on view of the pinch, we're looking partly down the barrel, so down the center of the Birkeland current at the pinch as it occurs. And those images look very different to the hourglass images. But again, we will dissect those as always, be brave, be curious. The truth is waiting for us. Until next time.